Well, we are going to start today's online seminar. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to join today's online seminar. On behalf of John Christian Hospital, I would like to express our sincerely grateful for all of our participants from different countries and different sectors. So this is the second session of the series of webinars that we hosted. Today, we invite Dr. Roy Lee from Zhonghua Institution for Economic Research to share his insight on the economic growth impact caused by COVID-19, particularly in Southeast Asia countries. Um, before Dr. Lee start his talk, I would like to invite one of our co-organizers, Mr. Jeff from Metal Industries, Research and Development Center to say a few words for the remarks. Jeff, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeff from Metal Industry Research and Development Center. I'm very happy to join today's online seminar. Thanks, Dr. Bao and Zhanghua Christian Hospital. And wish Dr. Lee. The presentation is successful. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. So now we will invite Dr. Lee to start his presentation. Dr. Lee, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nina and colleagues from uh, ASEAN countries and as well as from other parts of Taiwan. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, join you today for this uh, web-based uh, seminar. Uh, I understand that most of the uh, Colleagues today here are from the uh, medical sector. I, I'm not an expert professional uh, medical uh, working in the medical area, but I would like to spend the next 25 to 30 minutes sharing with you uh, the likely economic impact that we're observing uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, to share to share some light on the possible implications for the healthcare. Uh, sectors. So before I, I start, can can I confirm that every, everyone is able to see the slides now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Let me just play the slides. Okay. Yeah. Good. Now, probably you have already noticed that I I put the word, the term likely in my title, because as the pandemic is still unfolding, many of the impacts that I'm going to share with you. Are, in a, are still uh, developing in a very dynamic way. So what I can share with you is uh, what's being observed of the economic impact so far, but uh, as things are still unfolding, things might change very rapidly over the next couple of months. So uh, it is the likely economic impact. Some of these impact already happening, but some of them might take a huge a or different direction. In, at a later stage. So please take note that this, the, the slides or the information I'm, I'm going to share with you today are, are still uh, changing in a very dynamic way. Uh, I'm from the, I'm the deputy director of the Taiwan WTO and RTA Center. We work basically on trade policy on uh, multilateral, bilateral, and also regional levels. Uh, the reason I'm here today is since two years ago, we worked closely with the Changhua Christian hospital in promoting Taiwan's uh, new sub-plan policy in uh, medical and health care uh, partnership. And I will come back to that as uh, some of the implications today I'm going to share with you uh, as well. So let me start with this slide. Well, I think this is a familiar uh, figure that everybody today is, is uh, 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 trying to uh, understand the, the impact, the magnitude of the COVID-19. Uh, uh, pandemic. Um, I, I took these uh, two slides from our World in Data website. As you can see, some of the ASEAN countries, uh, especially Singapore, the number of confirmed cases are still growing, even though the, the speed has been slowing down, but the number is still increasing. But on my right hand side, you can see the curve of daily, uh, the, the average death rate seems to be uh, coming down. So the the curve in terms of death rate is kind of bending. But I put a question mark here. 
because as we have been observed in the last two months, everything can change overnight. So currently we are seeing a, a, a tendency that the, 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 the pandemic is, is uh, over time gradually under control, especially in terms of the death rate that the current is bending, but it can change. But what is the gist here is that perhaps we have already reached the peak of this pandemic in, in terms of medical and healthcare. But what's coming up next in the next phase of policy challenge will be the economic impact that has been created by this uh, uh, um, uh, unprecedented uh, pandemic that is uh, uh, creating challenge and impact across different continents and across different countries. Let me start with this uh, um, observation. Now, as we all it's already well known that China is the first uh, country that is uh, experiencing this, this uh, unprecedented uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic, it become now pandemic. So what happened in terms of economic impact in China in the first quarter of this year, that is from January to March, provides uh, uh, some shedding some lights of what is going to happen in, for example, many countries in Europe, EU areas or in the United States in the second quarter. So let's start with what happened in China in the first quarter of this year, the first three months of this year, in, in, uh, as, uh, to reflect the, the, the likely economic impact of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Now, before the Chinese official uh, figure was published last week, several inst global international institutions have published their forecast of China's GDP growth for the first quarter. For example, the research house under uh, the Japanese institution uh, Nomura estimates that the GDP growth for China for the first quarter, as you can see from here, is minus 9%. That means China's economic size decreased by about 9% vis-a-vis the economic size of 2019. Now, UBS, the Swiss land, Swiss bank, prediction is about minus 5%. And the world's uh, forecast is uh, being published so far is, uh, by Bloomberg Economics. They predict that China's uh, economy will be, will be shrinking by the magnitude of minus 11%. This is the world's forecast that we have seen. Now, last week, China published the official figure. For the first quarter of this year, China's GDP growth is actually minus 6.8%. That is, China's economy is 6.8% smaller than 2019. Now, this is the worst quarter, if not the whole year, of China's economy in the last 40 years. Put in preci more precisely, this is the worst case economic performance of, of, of chi in China after they decided to push, to move forward with this so-called opening up policy about 42 years ago. Now, for the full, full year 2020, the prediction here uh, by Nomura says will be, China's growth will be still uh, positive, but much smaller than the forecast from last year. Nomura says the full year GDP growth will be around 1.3%. Sorry, I can't see my mouth here, 1.3%. UBS says about 1.5%. And Bloomberg economics say 1.4%. So on average, it's something, some, uh, somewhere between 1.2% to 1.5%. Now, World Bank says, World Bank's prediction is equally falling within that range. It's about 1.2 to 1.4%. Now. 1.2% is still very good. We are talking about uh, over close to uh, several million, sorry, several hundred million dollars of growth. But let's remember this. At the end of last year, December 2019, the forecast for China's economic growth for this year, 2020, is about 6%. Now they downgraded the forecast from 6% growth to about 1.2 to 1.5 percent growth. So the change is huge, and the impact will be 
um, we are still observing what will be the likely impact on Chinese uh, overall social uh, it, and other healthcare uh, sectors. Now, this is what happened in China in the first quarter. Then look, look, let's look at what, have, what, what is likely to happen in the United States for the second quarter. The reason being China, US entered the peak of its COVID-19 pandemic starting from March this year. So the economic impact of COVID-19 on US economy is going to be to surface probably in the next two months. So the worst uh, economic impact is yet to come for the US. We're talking about uh, from April this year all the way to June this year. So that's the second quarter. Now, we're already seeing some uh, forecast predictions. Goldman Sachs, it predicts the second quarter economic growth of the US will be minus 24%. Index for the European Union, the, the Eurozone, for example, which was represented by the yellow line is still declining. The PMI index for Japan, for example, is also uh, declining and, and similar uh, situation is happening in the US. So if the COVID-19 pandemic is not under control in the next month or so, we are, uh, predict, uh, we are, look, we are going to look at China, uh, the US number um, going in this way as reflected in the Chinese uh, experience. Now, let's talk a, took a closer look at what happened in China in terms of manufacturing activity. This is China's year-to-year uh, uh, -year change in manufacturing output at the beginning of 2020. And this is what, what happened in February uh, 2020. So there is a more than 10% towards minus 15% decline. And you can see the rebound is coming up because of the uh, uh, situation is relaxing. I mean, the COVID-19 uh, issue has been under control in China. So by March, factory output is start to resume. And this is what happened in the US now. So probably in April or even in May this year, um, the output in the US will be something like what happened in China back in February. So this blue line is coming down this way. So the, 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 the debate will be whether or not the US will be able to have a V-shape rebound after, for example, July this year, when the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic is under control in the US. But the, ju the judge is still out and there are still different arguments now on uh, whether the US is able to do what happened uh, in China. And the services sector was, is the, the, the sector that was, was hit, hit uh, was, uh, the impact will be most significant. This is the services sector uh, purchasing manager index in China back in February, March uh, this year. Well, it is understandable because of the COVID-19 uh, uh, measures, all the shops are closed, all the uh, restaurants are closed. Uh, all the transportation are closed, and especially tourism are basically shut down. No transportation, no airline, no travel, no people movement. So, so the services sector, including uh, um, related healthcare and the medical uh, sectors, are all uh, having a significant impact. Medical sectors are all uh, focusing on uh, providing uh, treatments for COVID-19 patients. But for other sectors, shopping, uh, tourism, they are all suffering from this pandemic. And again, we can see what happened in China is that the figure is, is rebound, is coming back after uh, March this year. So again, this is what happened in Eurozone. This is the green line is what happened in the US. And uh, sorry, the green, the green line is what happened in Japan. And the blue line is what happening, still happening in the US. So again, the, the question will be, whether these three countries or areas will be able to do this V-shaped rebound uh, uh, towards uh, summer this year. The, the job, the impact on job work is equally significant. The, the unemployment rate uh, across the board in South Korea, US, Germany are all uh, coming down uh, because of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, so in, in, in summary, 
um, the, the International Monetary Fund or the IMF just published its latest forecast about, about 10 days ago. The blue uh, column reflects IMF's original forecast in July this year. And the blue column reflect the adjusted, the new forecast by the IMF by April uh, this year. So let's take the world uh, as the example. In, in, in average, global GDP's average growth will be somewhere around 2.5 to 3% when IMF starts uh, the prediction in, in January this year. But they readjusted the prediction and moved the growth rate to minus 2.5% uh, when they published the later forecast 10 days ago. For the US, the original forecast is about 1.9 to 2%. The latest April 2020 forecast, the US uh, growth rate for this year will be somewhere around minus 6%. Now China, as I already uh, mentioned, the original forecast is somewhere around 6%. Now IMF is saying something about around 1.2 to 1.4%. For Japan, the original uh, forecast is about 0.5 to 0.3%. Now the, the latest forecast is somewhere around 0.5%. More surprising is Germany. Uh, Germany is actually doing relatively well in terms of combating COVID-19 vis-a-vis other uh, uh, European countries. But in terms of economic impact, it's still huge and much greater than, for example, Japan, China, and the US. The IMF is predicting uh, economic growth for Germany this year will be minus 7 to 7.5%. One of the worst hit countries in terms of economic growth uh, because of the COVID-19. Uh, I haven't really figured out uh, the reason why IMF is putting this very pessimistic forecast for Germany, but I think there will be, we will, we will find out from the IMF report on why Germany is the most, uh, the heat, the impact out of COVID-19 on Germany is the greatest. Sorry, doc, uh, Dr. Carl, Nina, you will be alerting me about the time I spent. I have roughly uh, about 10 minutes to go, right? Okay, so I assume I, I'm, I'm right. I'm, I'm still, I'm also counting on the time. Now, let, let me move on <coughs> to other numbers. This is the um, a very uh, uh, a bleak forecast by the World Trade Organization equally about 10 days ago. You can see uh, the, the UA, uh, sorry, the WH, the WTO, the World Trade Organization is very optimistic, sorry, very pessimistic about trade uh, situation, uh, the global trade situation in this year 2020. In the optimistic scenario, according to the WTO, global trade will decline by 12% for the year 2020 this year. In the pessimistic scenario, WTO predict that global trade will decline by minus 32%. Now, minus 12% is already very pessimistic to me, but according to WTO, this is already a very optimistic scenario. So it is just a reflection of how the, the magnitude of the challenge, economic challenge that we're all facing uh, for this year. Now, let me move on to uh, 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 some of the ASEAN countries' performance. Um, Taiwan, according to uh, IMF prediction, uh, this year we're going to see a minus 4% uh, GDP growth rate, even though my institute uh, also published our uh, forecast uh, just last week. And our number is not minus 4, our number is uh, positive 1.1%. So we will see who is making a, a more uh, um, a reasonable forecast towards the end of this year. Now for ASEAN countries, Indonesia, IMF projection of Indonesia's economic growth will be 0.5% for this year. 
Now, the original uh, forecast of Indonesia's GDP growth will be somewhere around 5 to 5.5 percent. And the new projection now, because of the COVID-19, uh, uh, GDP growth for Indonesia will be somewhere around 0 0.5 percent. But the good news is that in 2021, Indonesia's uh, economic growth will be coming back uh, in a very sound way, healthy way. So you can see a robust 8.2 uh, positive growth for Indonesia economy. Now for Thailand, the challenge is, is, is also very significant. According to IMF, the prediction, the projection of uh, Thailand's economic growth will be minus 6.7%. And for Malaysia, it will be minus 1.7%. But again, the good news is that for the year 2021, which is next year, everybody is going to have to have a very significant rebound in terms of uh, economic activity and, and growth. So the Philippines uh, projection for uh, the, the year-round growth rate will be 0.6% and for the year 2021 will be 6.6%. Uh, Vietnam, relatively uh, uh, good in terms of uh, soft, the economic impact. Uh, I may have predict that Vietnam will be able to uh, 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 to enjoy a, a positive 2.7% GDP growth and for 2021 will be 7%. So overall, we are seeing everybody's suffering a different level, different degree of economic impact. Some countries are doing a little bit better than others, but in, in general, as a rule of thumb, some all countries are, are feeling the impact of the COVID-19. Now, countries among ASEAN uh, countries that is likely to suffer more than other uh, countries are those who, for example, having a higher level of contribution of the travel and tourism sector. This is one of the reasons why IMF is predicting, for example, economic performance in Thailand will be hit uh, relatively harder than other ASEAN countries. Now, this is the contribution of travel and tourism to ASEAN economies as uh, prepared by the ASEAN Secretariat just a few weeks ago. Now the green bar reflects the share to GDP by the travel and tourism sector to that particular ASEAN country. And the green uh, bar is the share to the total employment. Now let's take the Philippines as example. The contribution of travel and tourism to what's as a share to the Philippines GDP is towards 25%. And in terms of the share to total employment in the, in the Philippines, it's over, well over 25%. So that means if travel and tourism sector is not able to resume its operation, it's not able to receive foreign visitors, or it's not able to attract domestic travelers, then the economy is likely to suffer uh, a, a la, la, higher level of impact than other uh, sectors, especially and as well as other countries. Now, Thailand, for example, Thailand's uh, travel and tourism contribute uh, over 22%, around 22% uh, uh, in terms of the share to the GDP, and it offers over 15% of the employment rate. So, uh, in general, Cambodia, um, the Philippines, and Thailand, because of the weight of the travel and tourism, it is likely that they are going to see a higher impact of the COVID-19 because of the slowdown uh, or, or because of the shutdown of the two travel and tourism sectors. Now, let, let, we are all hoping for the best, but we also need to prepare for the worst. Now, in the best case uh, scenario, as I already mentioned, 2020, we're going to see a not doing so well year for everybody in terms of economic growth. But the year 2021, we're going to see a significant rebound, right? Especially for uh, developing countries, 2021, well, we are going to see a very significant growth, positive growth, growth on average in terms of economic activities. But there will be other scenarios that we need to uh, take into account. 
For example, this is again a alternative scenario provided by the IMF. If there will be a new outbreak of COVID-19 in 2021, for example, towards the end of this year and early next year during winter time, then the situation in 2021 will be will continue of what we are be observing this year. We're going to see a very significant decline in GDP growth for both advanced economies and emerging and developing economies. Again, another scenario is that if we are going to have a longer outbreak in 2020, for example, uh, we cannot control the pandemic in EU and US beyond summertime this year, plus there is a new outbreak in 2021, then the, this will be uh, the worst case scenario. You can see world economy will still suffer all the way to the year 2024. So let's let's cross our fingers and hope that this worst case scenario scenario will not happen, and and it is just a a, a, th a theoretic scenario. Now, um, so the implication <laughs> in the ta in Taiwan's case, we are already seeing many com companies start to put more weight uh, uh, and attention to the so-called resilience of the supply chain. Now, many country, many companies in Taiwan, for example, who have a large concentration of manufacturing capacities in China, they suffered much higher uh, disruption for the first three months of this year because of the outbreak in Wuhan and, and, and in surrounding areas. For other uh, uh, companies who have uh, 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 suppliers from the uh, Mexico or, or you know, Latin American countries, they are also now suffering now because of the pandemic. So how to increase the level of supply chain resilience becomes a top priority for many companies in Taiwan. Now, for, to increase the levels of resilience, you need to have the ability to, of foresight, that is to predict the next wave of risk, the next wave of, of uh, epidemic or other uh, natural disasters. You need to diversify your supply uh, uh, network. You need to diversify your market. And you need to sense, be sensitive to, for example, new opportunities. Many companies, uh, here in Taiwan used to put their focus only on China, US, and Japan. And now increasingly, they are now moving to uh, ASEAN countries. And you need to rebalance. Rebalance between economic or, or economic or manufacturing efficiency vis-a-vis -vis economic security or supply security or supply chain uh, resilience. And the last factor is how you, you should you can increase your local level of localization. That is, you don't just manufacture uh, your products in, in China and uh, export to the US. You should try to localize to understand the demand of the Chinese market. And the same by the same token, localization also applies to Taiwanese and other foreign investments participating in ASEAN countries. So in summary, sorry. In summary, um, many Taiwan companies are now pursuing a very different supply chain model. Now, before the COVID-19 pandemic, the US-China trade war are already pushing many Taiwanese companies to reconsider their sub supply chain structures. So the strategy they are pursuing, for example, include, first of all, China plus one model. So you don't, you don't, you don't focus, concentrate so much on China, you need to have alternative partners, uh, most likely in ASEAN countries. And for those countries who, who see US as the number one export market, or for those companies who use a very high level of US technologies, the, the so-called ABC strategy is probably a preferred way to go. ABC stands for anywhere but China. That means you have to reduce your reliance on, on, on China to avoid being dragged into this trade war. Now, 
the, the COVID-19 pandemic is actually accelerate this process of, of uh, ABC uh, 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 strategy. The last model is the diversification and localization, which I have already mentioned in my last slide. Now, <laughs> the implication for the implication for the healthcare sectors. People start to talk about the so-called public health security or the PHS. The idea being uh, how you ensure in terms of public health, self-sufficient and self-reliant. For example, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, most countries, including Taiwan, stopped, stopped exporting uh, personal protective gears, including facial masks. So uh, 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 think tanks and you know, uh, idea leaders in the US start to talk about how can we ensure public health security? How can we elevate the level of public health security in the US? And people start talking about reshoring, that is bring back health care and other capacities and talk about uh, people start talking about how can we ensure strategic stockpile not only for for food and energy but also for public health uh, uh, relatives uh, 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 products and services and uh, how can we coordinate uh, 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 global trade in light of increasing level of trade restrictions so people are arguing that many of the trade restrictions are that they will be hidden agenda of trade protectionism when they are uh, uh, imposing trade restrictions because of public health security uh, concerns. So this become a, a lot, a very important debate after, uh, I think after the COVID-19 pandemic. And also the globalization is under attack. Many people about, talk about the, the pandemic, the root of this pandemic is globalization. So if there's no globalization, or if the level of globalization is, is not as uh, as uh, we are being we are observing now, maybe we are not going to have a, a pandemic of this scale. And also, people talk about uh, if everybody is talking about self reliance, then how about cooperation? So we probably are observing a new phase, new generation of public health uh, global. Uh, cooperation and coordination as well, but we're, we 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 probably need new direction of this of uh, uh, of this uh, health care and medical cooperation after the COVID nineteen. Uh, but I will leave this question to you because I, I'm not. But you are all medical professionals. You know. So uh, finally, for the future of of ASEAN Taiwan cooperation. The structure change because of the trade war and because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, I think creates new opportunities, not only for Taiwan, but also for our ASEAN uh, partners. And also, uh, my, my office has been already received, receiving instructions from the uh, Ministry of Health on how we can share these, our Taiwan's experiences in, in this COVID-19 uh, control uh, uh, to to other ASEAN uh, uh, partners. I think we have some stories to share. Some of the experiences are positive, but we also have not so positive experiences. But we should learn from each other to reduce or to prevent <coughs> the next uh, epidemic or pandemic from uh, happening. <coughs> and finally, Taiwan has a very strong policy commitment. Uh, Dr. Kao and uh, he, her uh, team and, and her hospital are one of the key uh, participants in Taiwan's New South Wales policy in medical and healthcare uh, partnership. I have a website, a web address here, which is in English and which uh, summarizes the direction of the New South Wales policy on medical and healthcare partnership. So I think I, I encourage you, I invite you to take a look of this website and uh, I think uh, Nina will be ready to answer more questions about this new stuff on policy on medical and healthcare uh, partnership. So I'll, I'll wrap up my uh, presentation here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lee, the great presentation. And today we are very lucky. We have three reactors will share their comments about this topic. First, I would like to invite Mr. Allison. 
Yes, thank you, Dr. Nina. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yi, for uh, your very, uh, very impressive presentation. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm the uh, chairman of the uh, medical and health device uh, manufacturer of the Thai uh, Federation of Thai Industry, not, not the president of the Thai Industry, and uh, Federation Thai Industry, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah okay, uh, I think we, 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 we in the whole region, we are facing the same problem, the same crisis. Uh, but uh, in some country, you uh, we have we have learned the lesson from from other country, and we try to do. I, I think every every country try to cope with the, uh, the how to control or how to uh, live from this crisis. In Thailand, uh, we are. Uh, at the beginning, we are very suffer from 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 the uh, the, the pandemic uh, until last month that we have uh, the government have announced the state of emergency and do a very good job until today. Uh, today we have seven new cases today for the new COVID case, and it's the fourth day, fourth consecutive day that we have. Uh, lower than 10 patients a day. Uh, that I, I hope that this will be uh, very uh, good so far, but uh, we also cannot very, uh, very satisfy with this because we are we don't know when we open up, we uh, open the lock, lock, lockdown. Uh, the same, if second wave come, it's very difficult to control and all the hard job, one or two months hard job that we have invest on that. We have satisfied the academy for that. It will disappear and we have to the, uh, redo again everything and very hard. Yeah. But so far we we have done a good job. Uh, I can say uh, following, uh, we, I think we have a very good model, the role model from Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is a uh, our low model country that we have very good uh, preparation and uh, good maintenance for the COVID. Yeah. So come 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 to the the come to the impact of the uh, economic impact for this COVID crisis. Uh, Thailand also get a uh, very uh, difficulty in this in this crisis. Because Thailand, as Saturday totally said, we are relying on uh, a lot on the tourism. Yeah, we have over twenty percent of the tourism in our GDP, and fifteen percent of the over fifty percent for the uh, employment in this segment in the sector. That, uh, but if you see the figure of uh, uh, Doctor Lee, that. Uh, from the IFS projection, we have only 1.1% for the unemployment from, from that projection. Uh, maybe it's not that low, but I, I think it's also can, uh, can we, we have, have some reason about that. Because in Thailand, we are lucky that uh, even though we are hit by the, uh, the, the, the tourism, uh, depend on the tourism, but our people here, we have a lot of food. We are we are we are self sufficient on the food, and uh, the and the em employment in the to tourist tourism industry. When they have no job, we go back to the rural area and to work there or have a very low cost of living in the in, in the hometown. That can relax a little bit, but anyway, it's still difficult to do. Uh, for, to live in in this situation, but for other for other uh, the the sector, I mean, I think it's quite difficult because uh, with when you cannot open, even though you can control the COVID in the country, uh, but you cannot open fully for the country. But, uh, if other country cannot control, and in Thailand we are is the. Uh, it's the hub of the traveling hub in Asia, in ASEAN. So we have a lot of tourists, tourists coming in. Uh, I have a lot of uh, 
threading here. Uh, so if there's limited movement from the people, also with difficult to 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 do the business and to expand the business also. Yeah, that that's the point. The only thing that I, I, I we cannot we cannot predict when uh, we we uh, live from this situation. The only hope that we can get rid of this situation is waiting for the vaccine. If you cannot have vaccine, you are cannot rely. You 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 not be sure that uh, you can have new case coming in. And if the second wave uh, explode. It very difficult to control the game. We have experience from some country that uh, even though you have a very small group, last few days we also have uh, about fifty new cases from the from from the uh, group of people. Yeah, that that. Uh, but but we can control this so far it's very good. And uh, the the other thing is, uh, I I agree with Dr. Uh, Dr. Lee about the the. Uh, the model about the uh, the new opportunity of the, uh, the 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 new model of the uh, economic model that after the trade war and COVID nineteen have passed, I think everyone can think in the same way. Either you are with the China Plus One model or NBC anywhere or the localization. I think it uh, yeah. is similar. Yeah. We have same idea, but how to do that? And it depends on I, I think it depends on each country or each company to 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 do that according to their capacity or their opportunity. Yeah. And, and for the for the uh, in Thailand, I think we we have a very good system of the healthcare system so far that we uh, we lucky that we can control. And from this point. I think we have ways we have strength on this and combining with the tourism and if the if the uh, economic if the COVID nineteen uh, crisis uh, gone we think we can moving up to the same uh, level or even more but we have to rethink how to survive in new, in the future not it's the new normal now we have to think how to do yeah but in Thailand I think I I I, I we we have a uh principle from our our uh, beloved king Rama Nai. we have a self-sufficiency economy principle in thailand that everyone can can live on that uh, i think that is very important for our people here to 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 uh, live on this and back to the uh future cooperation for the <laughs> taiwan or uh, in the regional, uh, not only taiwan anything in the real trade in future have to rethink really how to how to work together. What is the good cooperation? In future, I think everyone have to think how to be the partner, how to form the partnership instead of only buyer and seller. How how can we cooperate? Become a part of your partnership. Yeah, think of changing the changing the way of uh, the the way of me to the way of we together and have a win-win win-win cooperation for long term uh, possibility for, for 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 each other i think that that's all my 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 point that i want to add to this yeah thank you yeah. thank you thank you very much yeah thank you uh, mr Asen. Um, the next, I want to invite um, Sakela from um, Malaysia. He, she is the director of investment division of Malaysia Friendship and Trust Center in Taipei. Yeah, Sakela, Sakela yeah. please. All right. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I hope everyone in uh, good health uh, and safe. And again, thank you, Dr. Nina, uh, Kao, and team to invite us uh, to this uh, webinar. Again, thank you, Dr. Roy, for you know sharing us all these uh, indicators, economic indicators in our economy. So uh, as for Malaysia, I think uh, the positive news is that our Ministry of Health Malaysia, we highlighted uh, the actual number of COVID-19 cases in our country showed a lower trajectory 
uh, compared to in, uh, initial forecast by our Malaysian Institute of Economic Research. I think that is the good news uh, to us. So uh, I think all the figures and numbers is being shared uh, by Dr. Roy earlier. Uh, because in Malaysia, uh, our GDP grew uh, in 2019 4.3%. However, given the impact of the pandemic and also the volatility of the global crude oil prices, as well as the disruptions of supply, our uh, Malaysian Central Bank has now projected our economic growth uh, to be between a negative 2% to 0.5% in 2020. And based on our analysis, the industries that most affected uh, by uh, this pandemic is tourism, aerospace, automotive, chemical, and electrical and electronic industry. So to actually uh, to help our economy, uh, to bolster our national economy and to assist uh, businesses uh, during this challenging time, our government has announced stimulus package valued at 52 billion uh, US dollar. Among, uh, I think this is among the uh, highest uh, stimulus package in the region. So this initiative, uh, not just to address uh, the adverse health and social impact of the pandemic outbreak in the country, but we also support our businesses, uh, including the small and medium enterprises. So from this uh, stimulus package, 100 uh, billion ringgit Malaysian are going to the SMEs. So we hope that we can uh, collectively, you know, uh, help our economy uh, through, uh, uh, through this uh, very trying time. Uh, Nina, I have a question to also to Dr. Roy. Yes. Can I ask questions? Sure, sure, sure. you can ask, no problem. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Roy, I'm interested to know uh, what is the impact of the uh, pandemic COVID-19 to the uh, FDI inflows uh, from Taiwan to ASEAN country? Because you are saying that there is a new uh, opportunities to ASEAN countries. Does that opportunities uh, translate into uh, the FDI inflows to our uh, ASEAN countries? Yeah, I think that probably may be answered later. Then we'll finish last the, uh, the third one of the act. Dr. Lee will answer the question. It's okay. Okay, okay. All right. okay thank you sure. So much. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, my good friend. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, the last reactor is really a great honor. So we have Professor Poch yeah, from Philippines uh, with us. And he's a professor of the Asian Institute, Institute of Management in Philippines. And he's also an expert in the Asian economic research. So Professor, uh, professor Poch, yeah. Please. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Sure, sure, no problem. Uh, congratulations to the presentation uh, of uh, Dr. Roy. I think the main points I would like to raise would be on ASEAN wide, not only Philippines specific. Although I will note the data in the first slides showing Philippines has a very high rate uh, actually might not be even the truth, because we have a very low testing and we are only experiencing testing now. So testing is a very important of the long-term strategy. So with that, let me return to my main points. The main explanation for the global uh, uh, approach to solving the, pro the problem is collaboration and cooperation. I think that is well accepted. However, when we come to the realization that it is the social aspect of pandemics that will help political leaders and economic leaders think differently, then we are all obliged to educate political leaders and economic leaders on the most important thing about human beings. We are not shaped by economies alone or by political affiliations alone, 
and hence the common humanity of people is what will create the solution. Collaboration, therefore, is very important. And I will start with foresight, which is, I think, the first one in the model presented. Very easily, the world can inform each other about outbreaks, but we should report outbreaks at the level of detail that might be important. For example, the fact that it came from a certain region of China indicates lockdowns and uh, prevention of entry of tourists were limited to a certain place. So rather than look at national data, we are now looking at regional data and very specific to where the pandemics arose. This is a problem with all world organizations that report only on national data or industry data. They don't look at the minor details, to them minor, because they are too detailed. But in the 21st century, viruses are the devil in the details. If they are so small, you might think, I will not worry about the industry affected, for example, agriculture. And I note that in the presentation, only manufacturing and services were cited. I am glad our Thai colleague noted agriculture is very important. I headed a research team for the ASEAN network for drugs, diagnostics, vaccines, and traditional medicine innovation. It's called the ASEAN NDI. It is part of a WHO effort to make sure that the research for infectious diseases, including the possibility of pandemics will be addressed across the region. It is in this spirit that I am suggesting that cooperation with Taiwan and ASEAN. Maybe we can focus on the foresight part by looking really at the sources of possible pandemics, which is where we coordinate with other, not only economies and nations, but also industries that may be reporting to us the source, whether it be the agriculture sector where animals are the source of these pandemics, so that this early warning system will not be very national, but very specific to regions where they might be sourced. Our study in the ASEAN Network for Innovation of Drugs Vaccines tell us that cooperation is already existing but we need massive efforts, including Taiwan, which has cooperated with ASEAN in this regard, to make sure we are always understanding the big picture. It is not a point, of course, that this foresight will not lead to diversification. I agree with all of the WTO uh, proposals on the global value chain. It's not US versus China. I think if ASEAN and Taiwan were to partner with each other, the way we will be sensitive to the new opportunities will be regardless of who the political powers are and the large economic powers are. Focus on social and you will find out the rebalancing you ask will really be on human security, not efficiency of corporations, not political rivalry for trade wars, etc. Focus on people. I am glad that Changhua Christian Hospital is part of this because in the last Taiwan webinar with AIM, I noted that maybe it is a social aspect of our societies. For example, the Buddhist groups that have contributed a lot to pandemics and other disasters, the educational institutions and the research institutions in Taiwan that do a lot, not only in electronics, but also in pharmacy. I visited those areas. And so when we say, we now look for human welfare, let that be the mantra of all cooperation. Finally, when you localize, we need not only the local, but also the expatriate talents. There are so many from all over ASEAN where the talents are in Europe, in America, in Japan, in Korea, Australia. Maybe we can link with them 
in the true collaboration for what is known as the new Taiwan model of a uh, relationship with Asia, southbound policy in medical and healthcare partnership. We'll engage our ASEAN researchers, both in ASEAN and our ASEAN experts working in international arena, be that in multinationals or in international organizations, work together. So my appeal is for us to look at how we view the problem. Let us go for more granular data specific to industries, not only manufacturing and services, but even agriculture. Because in the end, the sources of cure might come from what are already known as cures in other cultures. And this is what a Japanese Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Honjo, has been suggesting. Let us not wait for new vaccines. Let us now work on the current cures and maybe re-engineer what is there. And thanks to new genome technology, be able to work faster. So congratulations on this symposium. I think it is highlighting an important part. Let us collaborate and forget that competition is the only way to solve human problems. I think Mother Teresa says it all, love for people, regardless of color, creed, nationality, or religion is very important. So with that, thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Professor Poch. Yeah, give us very good uh, feedback. Yeah, I think that in Asia country, including Taiwan, which work together. So Dr. Lee, would you like to answer the question, please? Okay, about the FTI. Um, the FTI will be coming back, but at, at a, uh, my prediction is at a slower speed. Well, because first of all, uh, travel hasn't been, uh, there, there are still a lot of restrictions, uh, physical restrictions for investors uh, or, or anyone who wants to explore opportunities to travel, uh, especially among Asian uh, regions, right? Uh, so I think um, hopefully um, uh, by the second half of this year, most of the restrictions are relaxed or uh, uh, partially removed. Then I think it, it cross-country regional activities will uh, slowly coming back. Now, you know, if we remember what happened uh, back in 2003 with, when there is a SARS outbreak, the, the epidemic, the period of epidemic is very, very brief. It's only about two to three months. And the infected countries are limited as well, right? But this time is is widespread, is across the region. So I think um, the investment is definitely coming back, not because of COVID nineteen. Well, the COVID nineteen actually really enhanced the decision making process to diversify and to increase uh, participation as the, as a way to elevate the level of resilience, right? And this is already happening uh, because in light of the US-China trade war. And US-China has a, is still uh, rivaling in technologies, for example. Just two days ago, US published a new list of export sanctions against uh, in China and the Russia military use technologies, right? So, so I think this diversification and also uh, Look, connecting with new partners is 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 the way to go. But the COVID nineteen, the COVID nineteen, in one hand, reinforced this uh, direction, but at the other hand, um, make things move slower than expected. Right. So I think it's, it's we are we are looking at a full resumption of all these events probably towards. Uh, early towards the first quarter of next year, but this year I think things will be slow down. It will be slowing down. Um, for example, people like me or Zakira, maybe you are also in Taipei. We are now more reluctant to travel. We we prefer to have video calls and you know video conference rather than you know physical traveling to other parts. But that takes time for people to really you know change their mindset and going back. To, to normal uh, economy and lifestyle. 
and what uh, uh, I think I think this is really there's a human touch as Professor just mentioned just now right the, the human touch part is something that I I missed uh, you know I, I provide a very technical presentation but what Professor has been mentioned about the human uh, part is equally if not more important than this uh, event so the human part is uh, I think it takes time for people to come back to a very, to the normal uh, way of life, including the normal way of engagement in, in economic uh, cooperation and investments. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lee. Sorry, because the time is almost up, so I need to close today's session. And before I close today's session, I think today's um, the the our video the all of our video will be going to upload to our website so if you missed today's and uh, any of the information you can replay the video we are going to upload tonight or no later and then tomorrow so and for more of information of our webinars uh, you can also access to our website yeah, so thank you so much for everyone and my friends Yeah, to join today. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, our three reactors. You are very, very great opinion and feedback. Thank you so much. See you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.